so we can begin now uh, chirag you can start with the anchoring we can begin yes very good evening to our convener dr lata ma'am and uh, arnav sir as well and to our speaker who i will be introducing in just a moment and to all the dear audience who have joined us this evening i once again welcome you all to zenith 2021 the annual finance convention by finjan the fic of ramanujan college so this is the second day of this event and as we move forward i would like to introduce to you guys our next keynote speaker now this man must be known to most of you finance enthusiasts as the minister for finance and the coer of the indian state of kerala however that's not all there is to describe him you see apart from being a politician and an economist he also happens to be a committee member of the communist party of india therefore a marxist and lastly he also represents the elapuzha constituency in the kerala's legislative assembly everyone today we have with us dr t m thomas isaac i would request uh, lata ma'am to kindly welcome our speaker and say a few words of wisdom hello good afternoon sir good afternoon am i audible yes audible uh, good afternoon sir and uh, the students of ramanujan college and uh, on behalf of uh, the principal also i welcome you to ramanujan college sir uh, if it was not for the covid times we would have loved to have you here personally over to our uh, college campus and uh, we are uh, doing a lot of work on uh, pioneering if work actually on uh, teachers training and students training so uh, and this is uh, especially for the students the finjan society of our college is organizing this so i i i also want to add sir i have been uh, we all of us here have been waiting for your session uh, more so because um, i i also happen to be from kerala and i was just looking forward to this session so <laughs> and uh, a special welcome you <laughs> welcome to you on that note sir and um, uh, i hope all the students will benefit from your session and uh, uh, hope you can keep some time for question answers towards the end sir uh, thank you very much welcome once again sir yes over to you yes dr lata thank you ma'am that is some very kind words sir ak sharma sir you can begin now the virtual stage is all yours members of the faculty and dear students as was thinking about what to speak this afternoon i am struck by the fact how fast and how rapidly <clears throat> the economic scenario in india is undergoing change i was thinking that we were going to discuss about long term policies uh, in india economic policy in india but now i realize <laughs> we are back to where we are one year back thinking about how to overcome the present crisis we were thinking we were going to have a v shaped recovery okay it was a very sharp fall in fact uh, in the first uh, quarter a contraction of the economy was the highest largest in the world but then overall it declined by 10% and we were thinking we are going to grow by uh, around 10 to 12% percent a kind of v shaped recovery but now it looks like with the second wave of covid that we are going to have a more l shaped recovery it is going to take some time before the economy recovers i do not know if whether we are going to go into a once again a negative zone on of economic growth that's very certain our policies have now go to reorient towards how to get out of the present slump economic slump which is inevitable and um, what we should do in such a situation of economic recession is very well known this is no ordinary economic recession we have a situation where demand has fallen because of unemployment as well as incomes have fallen and this is going to accentuate in the coming days 
at the same time you have a situation where the supply chains are broken so you have a pressure on the economy both from the side of demand and supply and the net result is so at the halting recovery now is once again set to a course of uh, stagnation and what should we do what should be the economic policy in this situation every macroeconomic student knows that in such a situation when aggregate demand has fallen for what or be the reason whether it be because of decline in consumption or will it decline in investment the fact is aggregate demand is sharply falling and is going to fall in such a situation the macroeconomic policy will have to be oriented towards increasing the aggregate demand boosting the aggregate demand and how can this be done the consumers have no income to buy purchase their incomes are fallen the investors they don't may have surplus funds do not want to invest because uh, the, the their spare stocks are piling up and prospects of profit making in the future looks dim therefore they do have they have resources of, but they don't want to invest therefore there is only one player in the economy the government who also have no constraint of resources they can print notes they can borrow or they can raise the resources in many ways that individuals can't therefore resources is not a constraint and unlike the private investors the government need not be bothered with the profit they would get they should be more concerned about what should be the macroeconomic impact of the spending therefore government is the player our macroeconomic teachers who has got to intervene what should government do government should expand expenditure expenditure it should follow an expansionary policy and not try to say keep the deficits down or have a balanced budget and so on there is something sacro sanct about deficit surplus or balanced budget everything depends upon the circumstances if you have a time of inflation then we should uh, um, keep the expenditure low try to have a surplus budget if you have got on the hand a situation of recession falling aggregate demand you should have a deficit so therefore my first argument proposal would be that india should not be now at this stage bothered about fiscal deficit having to bring down to a, some sanctified number of 3% and so on. the economy demands that a boost be given to the demand the aggregate demand and the four government should expand expenditure we should allow the fiscal deficit to increase then the next question would be in one what items do you expect what should be your say allocation of the resources which sectors now in the present circumstances i would argue that you have to provide relief to the people um, now already migrant workers are on the move um in kerala today these two days are going to be virtually um uh, say lockdown days in kerala the bombay metropolis and so on have come to a standstill and therefore people are going to lose the job and therefore the primary focus of public policy should be to provide relief how do you get money into the hands of the people i have a proposal the proposal is the best agency program would be mahatma gandhi rural employment program 
But you may say, how do you get money to through um, workers, through Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Program, Employment Guarantee Program? Because COVID reasons, there are restrictions on collection, or come, people coming to the, or having large scale jobs undertaken and so on. I would say that you give one year's advance to all the workers. You know how much each worker earned last year. Therefore, you give them advance to equal amount. It didn't be a grant. You can recover this money over the next five years. But you will have pushed something like 60, 70,000 crores or rupees into the hands of ordinary people, you see. And who are these people? Who on their own have said they want to work manual labor. So therefore, there is no question of diversion of funds. There is no question of, uh, uh, say, ineligible people getting grant and so on. Because the most needy people, the poorest, they take recourse to MGNR ETS. And the money that you're giving is not only an advance to be recovered over the next five years. So I would argue there is a self-selection process which determines these are the most needy people in India. Therefore, what government of India must do is they must allocate more funds, double the amount of allocation, so that instead of 100 days of employment, actually they get only for 50, uh, 40 days of employment on average. You guarantee the minimum 150 days of employment, increase the allocation, gives last year's earning as an advance, you would have pushed into the economy to the most needy people, something like 60, 70,000 crores or rupees, and there will be no leakage because there is a perfect uh, DBT system for transfer of the money to the workers. And um, that would be a great relief and will boost the rural demand and will contribute to the increased aggregate demand. I have never understood why central government is not doing that. Instead, invents were various summons and uh, various types of transfers and so on, which are all leaking. So this is my simplest proposal. In the short period, immediately to give a boost to the aggregate demand and relief to the people, provide one year's, past year's earnings as advanced for the current year work and recover it over a period of time. Yes. So I think uh, this would be a very, very important way of intervening. Second, there are so many welfare programs and social programs which needs additional money. I would say the most important should be the health, health sector itself. Now, last budget, it was stated that health sector gets the biggest increase, um, some two lakh crores or rupees, etc. It's all humbug. For the simple reason, you have padded up these numbers by adding to the health sector the related sectors like drinking water, entire Jaljeevan mission allocation has been added to the health as health related sector is. If you take actual allocation to say health sector, there is hardly any increase. Now you're facing such a health crisis for the last one year. This is the last you should have spent. Government should spend much more on health. Uh, double the expenditure on health. Now there was a promise made that you are going to um, um, make all the primary health centers into under an Aishman Bharat into uh, refurbish them. But nothing has been done. So this is a time. Make this crisis as an opportunity to revamp the entire health system in India, provide better medication to people and so on and so forth. 
we are witnessing right before us what the present policy is leading to look we have had this crisis covid for the last one year and suddenly you find you don't have oxygen what kind of planning is this or suddenly you find you don't have medication really much the is to be important that is available so then you have a situation you are export you have been exporting vaccine and suddenly you don't have the vaccine you see and then you find uh, hospitals are turning around the patients and they are not accepting the patients because there is no capacity to see them what a mess is this and therefore gives an opportunity to use the crisis an opportunity to spend therefore this is uh, my argument would be that you spend on leave spend on social investment in india now a macro economic concern would be that it can lead to prices okay suppose you are following as uh, pursuing a expansionary policy it can lead to inflation now that is that is not um, likely for the simple reason there is so much unused capacity and there is so much real demand for the people therefore increased expenditure is not going to lead to inflation but utilization of uh, the unutilized capacity excess capacity but the fact the reality in india today is that the prices are rising now it is uh, highest in the one past one year the last month's uh, inflation rate so why is it so the people are afraid you spend more it can result in a situation of inflation and stagnation something called stagflation for which keynes has no answer keynes has the answer when you have recession and recession is accompanied by deflation but now if recession is accompanied by inflation and you have a situation of stagflation you cannot use uh, the keynesian recipe and therefore we have to look into why there is inflation my argument is the inflation is created by primarily by the petroleum prices if india government reduces the excise duty or import duty on petroleum crude petroleum on petroleum products Um, to the level they existed say two years back petroleum prices will fall is a basic could contribute to the production of family commodity and transport and therefore it will dampen the inflation this is very evident the second source of inflation is food inflation there is scarcity of food well you have such a low big stock of grains lying um the farmers are on war path saying that you procure our grain well you increase the uh, the flow price of grain you distribute the grain um at the same price uh, existing price and that will result in dampening inflation in the food grain food grains and food supplies so the sudden measures can be taken and with uh, for example with so much uh, foreign exchange stock with this uh, we can definitely import additional food grains or food stuff therefore inflation should not be can be controlled and we should follow an expansionary policy now when we look at investment what would i i accept the proposal for atmanirbhar 
a greater self-reliance. We have a big domestic market. And therefore, it's really right that we look at self-reliance, that we try to increase our manufacturing base within India and invest upward. Um, but I would add one more, and that may be of interest to you students. There's something very big is happening in the world because of COVID. You know what it is? The big change that nature of employment is. See, before COVID, only about half more, uh, I mean, it's uh, something like um, 50 lakh. Workers were, people were working from home. Today, the number has increased to three crores. In another five years, it's likely to become 18 crores. This is a fundamental change that is taking place. You look into any uh, IT park in India. Only 10 to 25 percent of the workers are there. Even government employees are asked to sit in the house and work here. So it's becoming any work process, production process, we can be digitalized. Work from home is becoming the norm. Now, when you are working from home, it doesn't matter whether you are working from New York or you are working from Delhi or Rwanda. So far, we have been trying to build big parks and so on, attract subcontracts from developed countries and provide subcontracted work within our parks. Now we need to do that. We can have of educated workforce to work from home. In fact, this is something that we are trying to do in Kerala. In my last budget, I have put a big proposal to attract 20 lakh jobs to Kerala, working from home. Now, if you want to do that, there's a precondition. The guy should know how to work on, on a digital platform. So you need to have a kind of massive reskilling program. I'll give you one perfect example. In Kerala, we are already in the process of do, doing this. We have set up a specialized vehicle called K-Disc, which is in charge of negotiating with employers abroad uh, and also skilling our youth, not only youth, women at home. Kerala education levels are very high, but unemployment rate is also very high, four times the national average. Therefore, women's participation in the employment is one fourth of men. Majority of women just become housewives. Even if they start on a job, they would break their job later. Therefore, we have <coughs> a last vast army of eminently employment uh, employable uh, female workers as housewives at home. We are telling them we'll skill them and provide them with employment. So this, we have been on this business for the last two months. And I'll tell you a big uh, firm, accounting firm, the biggest in the world. They came, they won 5,000 week of graduates. Now we have big graduates, any number, but they should know the sufficient fintech capabilities to work 
on the digital platform. Now we are starting a big skilling program for BCom students so that they get to know the basics of uh, working on a digital platform and then they can be employed. Uh, one of the biggest um, say employment agents in the world, say uh, freelance.com, um, just to give the scale of the operation. The last five years, they have given employment to nine lakh people, nine crores people, not lakh, sorry, <laughs> nine crores all over the globe. Um, we are negotiating with them. So India should do something like this. We should make use of this opportunity. Roll out a skilling program of scale and parallel anywhere in the world in collaboration with the state governments and agencies. And we try to find ourselves a place in the gig economy so that we will come out of this COVID crisis much stronger, uh, which a large um, army of workers now working on a digital platform from the house. Now to get the employers to foreign companies attracted to Kerala, what we have offered them is one, if they give employment to anybody in Kerala, we will provide the gratuity, pension, and so on. Oh, that is done by government. That is not their concern. So it's so much advantage for them. Two, any such person given employment to make up, to prepare their workstation and equipment, say a new camp, um, a new computer, or whatever they require. Um, loans would be made available with them with the industry. Loans which need to be paid back if they get a job. So with the government intervening in this manner and skill and supporting, I think uh, we should be able to get a piece of the big change that is going to happen in the global employment sector. So this is uh, in short, very short. I don't want to go on and on and on. Uh, but I would propose one, that we follow expansionary policy, don't care about the, the, the um, fiscal deficit and so on for the time being. Two, but inflation has to be kept in check and therefore reduce the excess duties on petrol and also uh, provide uh, more grains and so on for the poor and uh, I would say import if necessary. Now we would, uh, I would have argued that uh, we could follow a more self-reliant policy and try to get advantage, advantage of the change that is taking place in the globe employment market. And I would just make one more point, that is, take states as partners. Um, why as partners? Uh, because situation in states are different. Kerala is very different, say, from Bihar. Kerala is very different from Gujarat. And therefore, regional interests and challenges are so different, we should be able to work together in a true federal spirit. Let me put that way. I'll just take five more minutes and we'll stop with that, saying that what we are trying to do in Canada um, in the post-COVID period. Now, as you know, we have been in Canada investing in education healthcare, social security, so much. Not just now, for a long period now, that the people are better educated, more healthy, there are houses, decent houses, that is a homestead to stay, and so on and so forth. Therefore, Kerala's um, say quality of life index, UNDP and so on uh, uh, publishes them is more nearer to 
middle income developed countries rather than um, say third world countries. So um, we want to maintain this, but we cannot maintain this unless our economic base is changed. Our economic base uh, is labor intensive, low productive industries or high energy, slow growing chemical industries. And we do not create quality of employment so that unemployment is very, very high. And therefore, we want to change the economic base. Okay, you want to preserve in economic terms our redistribution, but change our production system. Now, we are not able to do that because we have not invested in infrastructure. See, we have been spending on social sector so much. We don't have not spent, we have underspent on roads, electricity, ports, and, and, uh, and such other basic infrastructure. And it requires huge investment. Unless we are able to do that, we won't be able to change our economic base, transform our economic base. And now COVID came. We continue to spend more on relief and so on. Difference you can see. Now COVID is spreading fast in Kerala, but there's no panic. There is sufficient hospital space for everybody. We will never allow the number of beds to be lower than the number of patients, COVID patients, sufficient oxygen or uh, relief to people. We have been providing food kit to every household in Kerala since COVID started, month after month. Every household gets a sufficient food kit, free, so that nobody goes hungry in Kerala. Now, all this puts more pressure on our infrastructure. Therefore, this is the second point uh, that we are doing. We decided we will borrow and create the infrastructure. But government cannot borrow without the permission of state the central government. State government can borrow. A borrowing is limited to 3% of GSDP. That's FRBM law. Therefore, how do we borrow? We create uh, a special purpose vehicle. So it is not government, a public sector company called Kerala Infrastructure Investment Fund Board. And we told this fund board, well, these roads, this electric lines, this uh, internet uh, uh, park, all this must be constructed. Total cost came to around uh, 60,000 crores of rupees. Now, this, it is a mandate to this company to borrow and construct this. Now, how do, why should anybody lend to this com company? There is a simple <coughs> business model. <coughs> Every government all state governments and central government today undertake annuity programs. Say you want to build a road of uh, 100 crores, then you tender it. You say the money will be given in say 20 equal yearly installments. Therefore, the contractor will calculate what is the interest that he will have to pay for the 100 crores that you will have invest now and call. Say for this 100 crore row, we need 1,000 crores or 500 crores. So the government of Kerala will pay over 20 years 500 crores, say uh, in annual installments. This is called annuity program. This is done by all governments. And nobody says 500 crores must be added into my borrowing, government borrowing. I will have to, this is a flaw uh, on the budget, current budget, not for our liability for the future, to be given to, taken for the FRBMA. Therefore, we said, 
okay, you enter and do this 60,000 crores of work. And we will pay you an annuity, which over 20 years will I'll permit you to repay the principal and the interest. We have legislated that half of our motor vehicles tax would go as an annuity to this institute. So this is something out of the box. <laughs> No government has done this like this. So we have now given permission for about 20,000 crores of road work at 10,000 for transgrid line, uh, that is the electricity line. We have got now, um, uh, say, internet connectivity to the, every house, all the houses in Kerala. BPL houses are going to have free internet here <laughs> in another four or five months. Free internet. And around uh, huge industrial parks and so on and so on. Already this has changed the face of Canada. The result is uh, so palpable. You know how it is changing the face of Kerala? You have spending 1,500 for a internet superhighway. On the superhighway, we are giving through service providers connectivity to every household, every institution, internet. We can think of working from home, 20 lakh people working from home for the global economy because every household in Kerala is going to be given assured broadband internet connectivity. And electricity won't fail because we are going to spend 10,000 crores in a new transmission line, another 5,000 crores to ensuring there are two lines from the um, say, transformer to the consumer. Now, we have spent on this infrastructure, transit, and uh, internet superhighway. And this is going to enable us to make advantage of the world global gig economy. That is to say, this investment is going to accelerate our growth. Suppose we succeed and 20 lakh people do get the job, which I am certain can be done. If I can mobilize 60,000 crores in infrastructure investment, a state government, that investment is going on, work is going on. Uh, it should be possible to achieve this uh, also. This will change the economic base of Kerala into a modern economy. High value addition, high value adding economy. And this will be transformation of Kerala economy. You have best distribution. Today, Kerala has the best distribution, but we have the highest unemployment. But tomorrow we are going to have an economy which has the best distribution and has the best production systems. Now, this is a regional aspiration. Why should anybody prevent me from doing, pursuing this vision? Now, people of Kerala is willing to spend more, I mean, willing to, uh, wanting to have greater um, welfare support from the state. Now, our we are providing monthly pension of 1,600, which is going to be raised to 2,500 rupees to 60 lakh people. No, but not two. It covers about 70% of families in Canada under social security. So, such a state, if you want to maintain a social security system, more near to Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, like Sweden, Norway, and so on, then I should be allowed to have a much higher tax GDP ratio. If the people of Kerala are willing to pay for the social security, why should anybody prevent that? 
this cannot be maintained at 14% tax GDP ratio. We want to have a 16% tax GDP ratio. Why should we be pre prevented from doing that? GST must be reformed to give much more uh, choice and option to the state governments. Or another example, we are now borrowing the 60,000. India government doesn't like that. They want to stop it. Uh, they are doing also spanky stuff. Enquiries by enforcement directorate, uh, income tax people, and so on and so forth. But at the same day, India government is doing precisely this. They are just uh, parliament session, they passed an act to uh, establish development financial institution. What is development financial institution going to do? It is going to borrow 4 lakh crores of rupees. For what? Not for government. To build infrastructure. And careless KIFB is nothing but this. Why should can central government create hurdles in the way? Therefore, we have to think in federal terms. So I think when we are thinking of financial policy, I am certain nobody, no speaker to you would have spoken about, spoken about need for a need for a federal fiscal system, genuine federal system. So this is my what I want to tell you. Um, I know it can be elaborated much more. But I will pose the four questions from you. A question came. I just saw it on the chat box. Um, but that question is, what is the level of brain drain from Kerala? Most of the drain from Kerala is not uh, brain, but brawn, muscle. <laughs> More unskilled workers or semi-skilled workers going to Gulf countries and so on. Or caretakers like nurses and so on. So I'm not very really bothered about them going to work abroad. Um, because the remittances are so huge. The remittance come to, coming to Kerala is nearly 25 to 30 percent of our domestic product. Therefore, I am not alarmed about the so-called brain drain. Secondly, now the chain that we are bringing in the economic base of Kerala, making it a knowledge economy, I didn't use this term, and this is the concept that the last budget has put forward, transform the regional economy to a knowledge economy. That is, that will bring this drain those who have drained away back to Kerala. Um, many people are going to come back to Kerala. And those of you students, you take your PhD, want to work, we are going to offer 500 postdoctoral fellowship of 1 lakh rupees per month. And this is what a digital economy means. It's a knowledge economy. Knowledge economy means it is to produce knowledge. So to produce knowledge, your higher education has been transformed. We are going to establish 30 uh, state-of-the-art centers of excellence within the university system, but all not autonomous within the university system, have this program. So this will attract the best minds who have gone away from Kerala, not just away from Kerala, from other states and internationally also. This scholarship is not going to be limit, limited to malarians. Everyone. Those who come to work and work within Kerala or study within Kerala contributes to Kerala's development. That's the concept. Yeah. I think I have answered that question. We don't have much time, so for questions should come. Uh, the host will be raising the question, sir. Just a second. He is unmuting himself. He'll be raising all the questions that will be asked. So before I ask uh, 
follow up questions i just want to say that it was a fruitful speech sir and i am sure people over here with the motive of gathering uh, exposure to the field of finance have some uh, important points with them i'm sure they're taking uh, taking away something sir so, would you repeat that question a little louder please i didn't ask a question i was just saying that it was a nice speech yeah. and it was helpful so we had some <laughs> questions from the audience as well as some questions of our own that we would like to ask somebody has asked me a question about entrepreneurship that person when they asked me the question because i couldn't read fully the question yes so it's akansha uh, she's asking sir thanks for your valuable insights what do you think uh, we as future contributors as entrepreneurs etc to the national economy can do so that india can transform into a developed country uh, from its current status as a transitioning economy yes the entrepreneurship would play a very very important role in transforming our economy now india has a very well established business houses um very dynamic uh, business uh, groups and so on. and therefore i don't think uh, we are suffering from um, entrepreneurship as such but i think we also need to promote a new a new breed of entrepreneurs what we call the startups see what is the strength of our traditional entrepreneur class it is their saving it is their capital okay it has its merits it has its, they, are, they have their that long experience and so on. but in the case of kerala kerala is a region which lack traditionally this entrepreneur class we don't have even a trader caste in kerala mavari uh, chettiars banias and so on. Uh, kerala doesn't have that um, in fact there are many scholars looking into the backwardness of industry in kerala who have been that lack of entrepreneurship is a key contributor to backwardness in the state but now we are trying to change that we are trying to engage a new breed of entrepreneurs from the educator now in the new knowledge enterprises the knowledge economy more than the money is the knowledge that is the capital see to take the biggest knowledge companies of today facebook google and so on and so forth apple they were started not by the biggest moneyed people in america but students all the students uh, who are the knowledge uh, who are innovators this is not sufficient to have the knowledge on the basis of the knowledge you innovate new ways of doing new ways of thinking new products so this innovation is very important therefore in the last budget whose um, slogan was creation of knowledge economy we are one transforming the higher education our higher education our element school education is very famous very robust not our higher education and we are going to invest in the higher education and make it uh, as dynamic as our school education one two a kind of um, innovation challenge for students um 20000 students in the first round not individual students student groups any group of students can come in the innovation challenge first round they'll give you 25000 rupees to win the second round you get 50000 rupees final round 2000 innovators uh, you have to pay them if they are 50000 rupees and those who win the challenge at least 200 every year we will pay them to set up the enterprise a huge uh, incentive 
mean, there are a number of other innovation promotion programs. And these innovators will be attracted into startup companies. And um, I don't want to explain, but a large number of proposals to promote startups. And we are thinking there will be at least uh, 15,000 startups with the end of year five. So this will be a new entrepreneurial class which will be driving Kerala forward. Yes, sir. So that's uh, very well answered. So due to the limitation of time, uh, I just have one last question for you, sir, from of our own. The idea of persistently increasing the national debt comes with the downside of uh, crowding out and high interest rates. The question here is, how can government intervention foster more stable and totalitarian growth? And also, what uh, approach uh, should they adapt? Increasing taxes is better or increasing borrowing? Your question was about the debt, right? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, how do you repay the debt? How do you no, make uh, the debt sustainable? I can repeat it, sir. Uh, the idea of persistently increasing the national debt comes with the downside of crowding out and high interest rates. Okay, so that's it. Uh, the question is that how can government intervention foster more uh, stable and totalitarian growth? I don't believe in that at all. <laughs> I don't believe in this crowding out theories. Now to think about crowding out, you have an idea that the total volume of donable funds is fixed and it's to be shared between the government and the private sector. So if the government borrows most, the private sector don't get money loan and therefore they're crowded out. All right. That's the theory. It's stupid because <laughs> the government spends money. For example, I told you, we are going to spend money on infrastructure which I argued and I showed is going to accelerate growth, then loanable funds would increase. So this theory works on the assumption that there is a fixed quantum of loanable funds and it has to be divided between the state and the private sector. Uh, and uh, if sp states borrows more, it will crowd out and industries will rise. I have two PhD students of mine. Uh, they are quite famous people. <laughs> One is Pinaki Chakravarti, is the director of uh, National Institute of Public Finance and Policy in New Delhi, and Lekha Chakravarti. Both of them have worked on empirical right to link the interest rate in India and the fiscal deficit. Okay, and their findings, two PhD thesis findings of the best minds in India has been, there is no uh, empirical correlation between the two. So that's yes, it. I, I don't buy that whole thing at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> and speak of this in a recession time, when you are giving money to the private sector, private sector refuse to invest. They don't want to invest now. It's not that Private sector is running around for investment and lacking money, not investing. They don't want to invest. They say investment decline taking place. Capital formation is going down. In such a situation, somebody to put forth the theory of crowding out is uh, <laughs> something very perverse logic here. Okay, so, so that all adds up now. Uh, yes, another uh, five minutes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, students, if you have any one, any more query, probably, sir, can take one more query. And before that, sir, we are very thankful that you have, we are, we are also academicians and we also do PhD and supervise PhD. And, sir, your aura and your personality as a natural speaker, and you are so down to earth and you explain to us in so simple terms. And sir, both the unique things, initiatives done by you and your government in Kerala, as well as sir, the innovative ideas for national level economic development also, they were very simple. And I think all the students uh, where we are getting very good response, they enjoyed the practical solutions that you have provided. 
And uh, Chirag, if you have one more question, sir, uh, can I take guess, it sir, up. I guess I do sir. have one last yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, please, yes. So here it goes. The manpower in India is often considered redundant because of uh, not being skilled enough, despite the India's uh, relevant programs. We're still lagging behind. Should we consider revisiting the policies or overhauling the framework in which the policies are executed? Is the question clear, sir? Um, one, India is a very large workforce. And we are talking about uh, uh, the one, the younger workforce, uh, two, and this younger workforce would come to something like a 20, 25% of overall workforce. Okay. This is this section that we are speaking about. The world is rapidly changing and uh, India has also to move ahead fast. Uh, now that fast transformation requires uh, very different types of skills. Our education system does not provide those skills to, uh, uh, to the younger generation. And that's the reason the government of India is taking much greater interest in skilling program. But I think it is totally insufficient. For example, the person skilling that people have, students have, will not allow India to take advantage of the gig economy in a big way. A special effort will have to be made for that. And therefore, our workforce, etc., I wouldn't call it redundant and so that's an exaggeration. They are all employed uh, in various sectors. And if there is severe underemployment, and if they are forced to work eck out in a low productivity, low productive areas, uh, well, that is not their fault. It's the fault of the overall macroeconomic policy. Now, let's take, uh, I'll explain a little more. We, in development economics, used to teach and learn about, uh, at least when I was a student, about uh, disguised unemployment. Many people think they have job, but they really don't have job. They, then their marginal productivity will be zero. Of course, in agriculture, the job requirement is only for three people. But it's a family enterprise, therefore five people or 10 people will be employed. Actually, you need only three people. So the margin productivity of the people who came in last is virtually zero, but they are accommodated. And this is due to the, excuse me, I'm called for another meeting. Okay, I'll just finish there. Um, therefore, it's a larger issue about uh, our nature of our macro economy. I would see it in that perspective. They are not redundant. They have no other choice other than doing this. But skilling, the question is very important. We have to, one, modify our higher education, uh, even our school education, so that uh, Automatically, every graduate, every student ends up this academic career by moving into uh, uh, kind of uh, moving a move, move out with a skill attainment. And um, it's very important, and I think we have to revisit, we have to think about changing the our policies. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, Sorry, I can't spend more time with you. That's okay, sir. Thank you so much for such a great session. It was nice having you here, sir. And thank you for setting out time in such difficult times. Uh, I'm sure people are enlightened by your script uh, speech. Thank you so much, sir. And also thanks to the audience for bearing with us all along. This is Dr. Leda. Yes, sir. Uh, she has just gone into a meeting, sir. Uh, she was there, yes. Do you know which part of Kerala she is from? Uh, no, sir. I am not sure. Exactly, which district? <laughs> no, if I had, unfortunately, there is some one engagement waiting for me. Okay, Otherwise, sir. I'll talk to you a little more. Thank
Thank you very much. Sure, sir. We will also invite you again, sir. Thank you, sir. Sure.